Garvey, and I love Jesus. I, I feel my life um, should be used to glorify God. I love my family. I love spending time with them. I love playing board games with friends or playing sports with uh, people I don't know. I love just interacting with people. I, I like to play basketball. I enjoy just spending time watching funny movies, just hanging out and getting to know people interacting. And I'm about to graduate, I'm excited about that. I love to travel, and these are just some things about me that you know, I, have to, I have to tell you for you to have an idea of who I am. My, that's kind of my identity. And you can decide if you, you, know, if you like those things, if you would want to hang out with me, if you'd want to spend more time and get to know me. You wouldn't fully know me from that little speed date. We would we'd only have an idea. So go from that. But if I'm honest, then you have a, a good idea of where you're going from there. You know if if you're going to want to spend time and and just be there. So for us at UH, I think that's important as we approach our our future students. Um, so we're going to be looking at the identity or identifying UH Kilo's identity, uh, their distinctive competence. First, we're going to look at the challenges that we face, and one of them is budget cuts, and uh, that leads to cutting programs, which nobody likes to do, but it's not necessarily a bad thing when you're trying to make this work, this complicated um, system all run smoothly and actually service the people that, that you're, you're claiming to service. Um, the strong survive, I guess, the you know survival of the fittest, the um, just that old story. Is, there's a, about 2,000, a little over 2,000 colleges or institutions that are higher education, and so all college students, anyone that wants a higher education, is divvied up, you know, up among those schools. And some don't make it. Some don't have the the customers or the capital streams, the students to stay in business or the cut programs. Uh, and maybe a more accurate word would be strategic or special survive or distinctive, distinctive, don't go extinct. Then we're, you know, the ones that last are going to have more, that, that do it right, that have a unique offering, are going to be able to bring more people in and hold them there. Um, we are a public liberal arts college. Did, any, did everyone know that we're a liberal arts college? I hope. Uh, and I, I'm going to ask you guys, what, one or two of you, what do you think of when you think liberal arts college? Just quick, one word. Prestige. Prestigious, good. Well rounded. Well rounded. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and looking at looking at those are other things that we have in mind when we think liberal arts college, and they are they they do stand out more. They're smaller. They tend to be much smaller, and they tend to, their goal is to form lifelong learners instead of actually preparing people for specific careers, and uh, and they so they focus like our two year degree our first two years at school kind of cover a lot of the, the liberal arts education. We're a public school, and what that leads to is we uh, we have to get money funding from other places at times, and those are. So we have perverse incentives based on us. This is a challenge that we face. And uh, I, <laughs> sorry, perverse incentives are the, is it everybody familiar with football or love football? Everybody loves football. <laughs> That's okay, challenge accepted. Um, the NFL had, had hard hits where people or players are getting concussed and uh, knocked out of games last year or for previous year, all through year, and they implemented a rule that they said you have you're fine for, for hitting the head or hard hits. And so what happened was people started getting low and taking out knees and there's been more season ending injuries uh, this year, eight weeks than the than the whole season or yeah, than the last year's whole season. So those are reverse incentives. It's when you say something and you don't mean for it to bring another result, but it does. On on UH we deal with uh, a perverse incentive, reverse incentive, that we need to have graduations at a certain level in order to get funding. So 
yes, it's good to have high graduation rates, but if you can't do it, you know, a normal way, then you just push them through. And that hurts us in the long run because what we're, the students that we're putting into the workforce, the alumni, how, are going to be how UH is kind of known on a wider scale, word of mouth. Um, and so if we don't put out, produce lifelong learners, people that are, are community oriented and, and innovators, then we're not going to be true to our mission. So the problems I'm focusing on are reaching retainable students because we have low um, graduation rates for, for well, any, any schools really. Uh, lowest on the, on, in the Hawaiian Islands, and then the identity, identity crisis is, I believe, why, where we, where we kind of fall short, because we don't know what to tell students that, that we are. We don't know what we're good at, and we don't know what to tell them about ourselves. So, we're just getting people to come in and, and check us out for a while, but our gradu my graduation, they're, they're somewhere else. And it costs more, it costs a lot more to, get a customer than to keep a student somewhere. Uh, here's our, my SWOT analysis, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of strengths. The, we have a high full-time staff, which is good for a public liberal arts or a liberal arts college. We have small class sizes, and we're very, very culturally diverse. Yeah. Uh, our location is Hawaii, but that doesn't stand us out from the other schools here. And that's a problem. And then Alex, the applied learning experience, is a is a good hands-on learner. It's it's committed to helping students learn through experience. And those are those are the main strengths I want to look at. The weaknesses we have a 36.3 actually graduation rate, and our location is far away. And that kind of ties to this opportunity down here. That 38 percent. This is I think this is the arrow supposed to be the other way. But 38% are within 50 miles of their home um, for first-time students, and then 15% are 500 miles or more away from home. So that's good for local students because they're not going to get anywhere in 50 miles. Um, but five, but the the 500, the mainland. A lot of people are going to stay mainland or stay international, and that happens as, as far as location. So the low low prestige, like how you said. Liberal arts schools, we we're obviously not showing that we're prestigious in our, in our liberal arts, um, and and our low low to no identity that we, we present. The threats that are that we face, their community and colleges are becoming more strategic because they they find that they're they can't just sit there and be like, oh, just come on in. It's been in the past where where people couldn't afford a higher like a four-year degree, so they'd go to some school, cool, some college at a, at a two-year program, but they realize and they're organizing to become more strategic in their in their uh, recruiting. And then established competition, like Bobby at Anderson, uh, there's, there's a lot of older, a lot older public, liberal public, public liberal arts colleges than us. Uh, some statistics for liberal arts college graduates are, are that 4% of undergraduates, only 4% are liberal arts college graduates. And of, but of those 4%, they're all smart. I just added four on that part of the graph. Um, but 27% of U.S. presidents are um, liberal arts grads. And of U.S. Nobel Prize winners, that that are educated in the U.S., they are the large grads, and 9% CEOs. So they they have a big impact for the low number that we are. We have a, a large impact on society and, and powerful positions in this in change. That's the salaries for starting off on average is 41, 5, and 78, 8, 5, mid, middle of your career. Some of the best best qualities of these these schools, and these are these are the ones that are present in the in schools that are doing it right and that have a distinct kind of identity. And I'm going to go down and we're going to see which ones we do. Uh, sort of evidence that we have a core competency in the liberal arts is important, and we do do that. We have we have good programs here. The Marine 
science is actually uh, one of the highest you know, hands-on marine science programs in, in the U.S. And the majority of our degrees are, are liberal arts disciplines. The commitment, we have a commitment to active learning, that's, that would be Alex. The, we have small schools, we're 4,083 this year, and we always hover around that number. And we have small, small classroom sizes, I think it's 22 to 1 for faculty ratio, and it just provides more intimate learning and easier to, to talk, so we have that. We also are, we have that same ratio affects this, that we have strong connection and interaction with our faculty when we need to talk to them. And, and vice versa, the faculty can feedback from the students. They can see where, where it needs to go next. And then a bunch, the majority of critical mass, I guess, live in, and we all live in those areas. Some more, there's, there's quite a few. We have a val we value co-curricular development, for sure, with the students here. And that is something that liberal arts colleges do. There's a diverse uh, student body, I guess, that we have one of the most you know, di culturally diverse student bodies in America. I'm looking at the different, the different uh, liberal arts colleges on the top ranking. We, have, we don't have more than a quarter in any, any race, and uh, three main races that make up our, our school are Asian, Asian, and Hawaiian, Native or Native Hawaiian. Order. And so there's a broad range. We see a lot of uh, students from, from Asia and that's most of them in Japan and China. So we have a commitment to, to civic engagement and community service. Uh, you see that with Global Hope, the sociology department helps with that. And uh, that's, that's important that, that we have that. We're involved in the community. Alex gets engaged with the employers in the community and brings in internships. There's over um, 50 employers at the last internship fair, fair and over 205 students were there. We're still trying to figure out how many how many internships actually got secured, but there was over 100 positions available. And then finally, majority of our, again, 75% well, of our graduates, or our students are undergraduates, baccalaureate. And finally, uh, the number of the full-time staff, we said 75% is a good ratio for us. One thing that we do not do is we don't have an admission policy that is kind of strict and selective. We, we, we're free with that. And, and that because we're trying to you know, serve everybody and we want to be all things to all people. And we can't really do that. We have to more act in a private um, type of mindset in order to, to become distinctive. Uh, we don't have a clear institutional mission statement at all. This is uh, you know, our motto, one learns from many sources. And everyone we've talked to does not, doesn't, I mean, everyone I've talked to hasn't known off, offhand what that meant as far as students. And then our, our actual statement. I'm going to read it like exactly. The purpose of our university, Ohana, is to challenge students to reach their highest level of academic achievement by inspiring learning, discovery, and creativity inside and outside the classroom. Our responsibility is to improve the quality of life of the people of Hawaii, of Hawaii, the Pacific region, and the world. It's very, very generic, I feel, and it could just say world peace. And, Good draw. So we we need to define that. We need to make that more centered to what we are and, and what we are as a liberal arts college. So we can act act, it, act that out. And for that, I, I recommend that we identify, we apply for membership with the Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges. They're a, a collaboration of 27 liberal arts colleges in the US. Um, and Canada, 25 states and one Canadian province. And they, they, they are committed, that's their mission statement, they're committed to sharing, raising awareness of the higher, like the higher quality of education that you get when you come to a liberal arts college, the, showing the, the impact that the students have. So 
they they collaborate, and that's that's one of the here are some of the the benefits of being a member of COPAC. There's there's benefits for administration, benefits for faculty, and benefits for the students. But the, the main point that they have is is they're centered and they're geared towards is this collaboration of learning how to be more effective in reaching students, in keeping students, in making learning more applied, more applicable, helping them to go out and be more prepared. Uh, metamorphosis is the only one I'm going to talk about. It's for students, it's the only one that's not really self-explanatory. It's an online sharing between the colleges that uh, research, uh, research studies that students are doing, they can put up there, and other students from other universities can give them feedback or even partner with them in that study. But nobody really, I mean, those benefits are good, but everybody wants numbers. They have to see results. To see results. And these are the 27 or 26 of the, I couldn't find the Canadian uh, numbers on the Canadian school. These are the 26 US schools and then UH in there. And it's their six year grad rates in 2007 and their full time uh, freshmen who came back the following year. Uh, the, I just, you don't have to really try to decipher it right now. I just wanted you to see where these fell on the chart, where we fell in comparison. And then in 2011, this is, there is a change. You can see that they moved up. So you can actually look at this. The, uh, the movements were, I would try to grab ones from different parts of the chart to show, show the growth in, uh, in these different rates when joining the, the Shepherd University joined in 2009, and this one joined in 2006, and they are actually uh, very impressed with their growth rates. The, this is overall for all full black members, is 60.5% in graduates um, over these five years. There was some that, that declined, like there was about nine schools, and to be honest, that had negative, but there were about 2% differences in there, except for one of the outliers was like 8%, maybe 7.7%. And so that kind of threw off my, my stats. I'm like, uh, it's about finance. So these girls were, these are good girls overall, and 70% in the full-time retention. Uh, and we'll take a look at the freshmen, the returning freshmen. This is the five years for those, those ones we saw change, 8.9%, 5%. 11.6 uh, was the highest change for those ones that I highlighted. And these were the kind of the newcomers to the program, and so how it affected them was, was what I was looking at. This wasn't really impressive because UH already has 71% you know, retention in freshmen. We just, we have a bad, um, we have a bad graduation rate, six-year graduation rate. That's the, that's the graph for it. Just to, they do trend up, mostly. But I don't think that it's really representative of the COPAC, maybe. It doesn't have too much variable. So. The graduation rate is where we find more. Uh, UH hasn't changed in five years. I mean, it has changed, but from 2007 and 2011, right back at the same. Uh, University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma has really flourished. I can show you. They, they grew 17.3% in their graduation rates. And the, they joined that in 2006, so that right at 2007, they, they started experiencing growth. Um, Fort Lewis was, or Shepherds was 2009, so they were growing already, but they, they moved more. And that's, this is the, the chart we're looking at for them. Um, these, the reason that this graduation rate is so important is one, the administration and the funding. We, you know, we have to meet graduation rate, and we can't do it. Um, they don't want to do it, you know, in a shady way or a way that's going to produce students that aren't able to, you know, interact or react to the environment and be effective. And that's one reason, because we, we need budget, we need funding, but we'll also have a more cost or more more students staying with us, and that's. That's important as well. We're not having, we might not have to spend as much time uh, recruiting. 
uh, and for in a study or not a study in the in a conference uh, the, it was the future of um, public liberal arts colleges and their leadership role in education. Yes. You know, the the president of Lafayette uh, University is one of the leading schools in in the U.S. for public liberal arts. They uh, the president was saying there that. He had a study a survey showed that parents parents are given a survey with with two school or a number of schools and they had one of the groups had just all the, the details as far as uh, faculty ratio what kind of education it was the tuition costs and the tuition costs were, were mostly the same but then the other group had the graduation rate and what they saw when when the graduation rate was included that. 15 or 16 percent of them were more likely to choose the schools with the higher graduation rate for, the, for their children, and and there was a deep difference in tuition costs, and that didn't seem to affect them. It was more of a graduation. So graduation rate is important, and I feel that Coblack is a uh, beneficial to to UH, and it's it's very cost effective because. Our next steps are we just need to kind of restructure our admissions policy, make it a little bit more strict and difficult to get in, uh, I, I guess. But on the on the list of all the schools, our admissions was was almost it was the third third lowest. So we wouldn't have to change how many people were admitting, but we would have to include an SAT um, an SAT uh, score range that it would have to fall in an ACT score and just put that on our site. You know, this is what it, it takes for um, for successful applicants. Uh, re we would need to rework our mission statement, be more direct, and talk about the public liberal arts college that we are and how that affects people, how, what, what we plan intend to do that, why we're a public liberal arts. Uh, then in the next, I talked to the director of the COPLAC, um, the council, Bill Snowman, and he, he was saying, you know, have an administrative official call me first, contact me first, and we're going to walk through it, see if it's even worth putting together a, putting together an application. And this is, this is what the application looks like. Pass it around. It's, um, it's actually Shepherds University. I talked with their director, and are willing to share it because it's online, but um, it's, a, it's an application for that got them in, and it just lays it out really simple. It's about 28 pages, so I guess it's going to take time to, to go through all the check marks that we have and explain how UH does that, why we, why we do that, what, what would qualify us to be associated with that, with the council and collaboration. So like you said, they have all the, those peer meetings, so there's more and more collaboration. Um, we create that application moving forward, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't cost anything but our, our time to, pr to produce that. And really, we have everything except for those two, um, two, two points. And so, and then I guess of course we would begin, you know, interacting with the other colleges. We go to the annual meetings and meet the the presidents of these different schools, and they would have to visit here, build. And Bill Spellman would actually be the one to come here, kind of, kind of see that, that it was something that they wanted to be or wanted us to be a part of. Uh, and that that is it. And so the the, the cost I didn't you know, it would depend on when you go. Is it the airfare? Honestly, it'd be airfare to these these conferences, and we may want to bring out Bill Spellman to butter him up, or but. So then, ending spot is we, we, we wipe out our graduation, our low graduation rate. We're going to see growth in that. Um, the average growth was over like over everything with with the negative um, with the loss of graduation rates. It was three point three percent average out over all twenty seven of them. So we would see some growth, I think, more because. Um, Location would uh, then be gone. We'd be the only school in Hawaii that was in this council, um, and then that would likely help with our prestige. You know, it would put us among other prestigious colleges, and 
and people would look at you know Copac and they would they would find us, they'd see us there. So that would help with you know targeting. We would we would have students looking for us, they're looking for college, you know, public liberal arts schools, then they would come find that we're we're a part of that, part of the elite group, I guess. Um, Copac, I'm not going to talk it up and say that it's all the best schools, it's the top 10 schools, the top 27 schools, it's not. But they are they are a group that's collaborating and, and working together to, to become it. That's, you know, that's their goal is to raise those awareness. Um, in that, we would acknowledge and use, you know, our, uh, we would kind of project, tell people about our strengths in Alex, uh, our location, our cultural diversity, our, our low student to teacher uh, faculty ratio and our small class size, we would be boasting about all those things with COPAC because that's what is associated with them. Um, our first time students, I explained that at the beginning why that's something that we kind of take advantage of. The rest of the percentage obviously falls between 15 and 500 miles. Uh, community college uh, becoming more strategic, we kind of, you know, we'd, we'd be forming our own strategies with this, with this council and we'd be able to we would maybe be paying attention to them exactly what we would develop in our own strategy. And then the established competition, we just, we just join them, we don't have to meet them. Um, we would uh, take care of that. Finally, yes, we would be the only school in campus associated with COPAC. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I guess I have a question in that if this were a college that were in the mainland part, um, I can see all that analysis really there. But when I look at this island where we're 2,500 miles away from you know most of the other schools that we're talking about at a minimum, and the high schoolers are 25 to 50 percent of poverty, um, you know, at a poverty level. And the history of this island is that we have um, used to be 100% sustainable, and yet we're paying five times the rate in some cases of energy and all these other things. I, I guess as you looked at it, if, if we were labeled the liberal arts and only that, and, and didn't look at where we were geographically positioned, I would agree with everything that you said there. Um, I guess I'm wondering, how much did you factor that into your analysis? The geographical setting? Uh, or location, uh, I, I, I factored it in just, I mean, I concluded it on weakness and, and that for that very reason, and the fact that only 15%, you know, go 500 miles away or, or more. Uh, that was definitely factored in, I, I don't know if I, to a degree, necessarily we are five, you know, we're 500 miles away from the long school, so that, that would be where, and we get those 15% possibly that want to explore and want to travel, and we would be, you know, we'd be forfeiting a lot of a lot of the people that are in the mainland. But we do have one of the lowest um, tuition costs um, on on the island besides BYU. They have lower tuition than us, um, and cost of living is higher. So it, it's not you know, it's not something that I can say is going to affect it. I don't think that. Copac is the only thing the school can do, should do for that. You know, we need to have better marketing um, in, in Hawaii, just being what it is, Hawaii, and um, the, the island, the sustainability, the, the opportunities in marine science. But I was trying to stay focused, you know, mainly on, on the benefits of Copac. I think one, other, one way to address that is also to look at the high school student, the local high school students that we're losing because they don't think there's a viable college mm -hmm. in the state. In fact, we as a state have one of the lowest rates of going to your own in-state college in Hawaii for like 49 out of 50. So that might keep some of our students here. Yeah. And, and also, it doesn't include being an engineering school. Harvey Mudd is a liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, right, right. No, I just, that, I wasn't going to go on the engineering side, but just the fact of, of looking at the numbers of, of Poverty and, and kind of, I guess, why this, because I was surprised too that we didn't have emissions for the criteria in there. But then again, how are we going to help people be successful? And I think why the mission has a quality of life is because 
you've got a large percentage of your population not going to ever leave the island, how are you going to ensure that we continue to be well-rounded and capable of doing jobs? And the trends, I don't know if that affected it, but trends such as when people graduate down from college anywhere, it's much less of a chance that you're going to get a job. Even though you know we're looking for continuous learning, but continuous learning to be able to adapt to any um, out opportunity that we need when we graduate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're already after four, so we have four, four, four forty-five for the next two presenters. So thank you very much, Matt. Sorry to cut off.